1972, at the request of family, she was driven to Lakeview Sanitarium for observation. It was the hope of Mary's family that she would receive a diagnosis and be treated during her stay. Mary Margaret was just 13 years old at the time. This is her story, as told in the case files from the Lakeview Sanitarium. Only one or two boxes remain after the children's wing of the sanitarium caught fire on a cold winter night in 1973. Those boxes contained some of the most unique cases to ever come through the hospital. In my playlist, there are three stories from these files. Mary Margaret Adams was born and raised in the Catholic Church. Her parents, Jim and Sandy Adams, had five children. Mary Margaret was their youngest child. When Mary was 12 years old, Jim and Sandy began to notice that she was changing. She had always been a lively child. She was mischievous and loved to play pranks on her brothers and sisters. She was everyone's favorite with her bouncy red curls and infectious laughter. At first, her parents excused it as a stage that she was going through when Mary began to break out in fits of rage and lash out at her family, once stabbing her brother's hand with a fork. They'd taken him to the hospital for treatment, and it was noted that Mary had injured him, but Mary claimed that she had no memory of the incident. Then, sometimes Mary seemed to regress into a much smaller child. She began baby-talking, playing with long-forgotten dolls and carrying a blanket. Her parents asked her repeatedly if she was okay. Had something happened to her? And each time, Mary would refuse to communicate in that state. It wasn't until she was again seen bounding down the stairs or playing outside, chasing frogs with her brothers, that when her parents asked about the dolls, Mary acted confused and dazed. She insisted that she wasn't playing with dolls, but instead had been reading or painting, or some completely other activity. She would giggle sometimes and tell her parents that her siblings must be playing tricks on them. But they weren't, as Jim and Sandy had both witnessed her playing with the dolls. They did question themselves and wonder if it was possible that she was, herself, pranking them, and that seemed likely, considering her mischievous nature, so they'd let the subject drop. Eventually, she began growling in a disturbing, deep, and rattling voice, seemingly coming from the darkest places in her soul. It was nearly animal-like in its ferocity. Her eyes would appear to darken, and her face seemed to change, almost widening at her jaw, her brow becoming more prominent and bony, and when this happened, she would speak in this guttural growl, speaking of the most frightening and unearthly things, violently insisting that she be called Abaddon. She would tell tales of reigning the heavens and the earth, of being one with the above and with the dirt and with that which is below. When her parents would touch her skin, it seemed hardened and cold to the touch, and then, as if nothing had ever happened, Mary Margaret would look bright-eyed and happy, without any distinguishing time in which to change, just back to her old self. Her face softened, her blue eyes, her forehead freckled and still clinging onto that last bit of childhood in its shine and newness. After one such encounter with the likeness of Abaddon speaking of destroying their family, bit by bit, they took Mary to their priest. They asked him to observe Mary, to pray with Mary, and to pray for what the family should do. 
In their honesty, they confided in him that they were afraid of her and that they felt that it was not only possible, but likely that she was demon-possessed. Mary had always loved Father O'Henry. He always had a piece of candy especially for her, and she'd recently begun to sing in the choir. Normally, this was for the adults, but Father O'Henry had taken notice of Mary singing brightly from the pews and made an exception. She was quite happy to be going to see him. Father Albert O'Henry did observe her, and he did pray with her, and he even asked her about the stories that her parents had told him. They spent eight hours together, and by the end of that time he asked Mary to wait outside of his office while he spoke to her parents. She was bright-eyed and clear of thought, and she did as he asked. In his office, Mary's mother nervously wrung her hands together, and she felt as though she were looking in on the three of them from outside the window. Her mind was swirling with fear and anticipation. She could not believe that she was having this conversation. Jim's temples were sweating as he adjusted himself in the chair to get comfortable, but he couldn't quite find the position that would accommodate his tense body. Jim, Sandy, began Father O'Henry. With all due respect, I wish I had the answers that you were looking for. I have not seen the behavior you claim to have witnessed. The option of an exorcism is met with extreme resistance without irrefutable proof. And it's being published recently that some previously understood behaviors could be something they now call split personalities. The church is sending more and more people to be observed in facilities before they can accept a recommendation to perform an exorcism. And even then, it's nearly impossible to be granted the permission that I would need. Do you understand what I'm telling you? He asked. Sandy doubled over and broke down in tears. But, Father, please, we can't be sure that she's not dangerous. Something is wrong here, Father. Jim placed his hand on Sandy's thigh, indicating that she needed to be strong. Sandy began to wipe away her tears. I'm sorry, Father, she began when Jim stood up. Father, we both feel as if you are our last hope to save our child. It is upsetting, as you can clearly see. Father O'Henry got to his feet, opened a drawer in his desk, and took out a piece of paper. Jim, take this, and take Mary to see this doctor. It's all I can offer you at this point. Pray that this is the answer, and if not, then come back. But pray. Do you understand me? Pray as sincerely and openly as you ever have in your life. Jim reached down and took Sandy by the crook of her arm, gently lifting her to her feet, and they left. That night, Mary began to scratch at her own face and speak in the growl of the devil's own voice. She berated her parents for their beliefs and laughed at them calling them fools. She tore at her bedding, shredding her blanket with her fingers and teeth. Her hands were bleeding. When Jim grabbed hold of her from the back and with such strength that a man does not possess, she threw him against the wall. They locked the door from the outside that night and called Lakeview Sanitarium. Early the next morning, they drove up the long driveway to the hospital. It was quiet and serene, and when the building came into view, it looked more like a grand hotel than a sanitarium. They walked Mary and Margaret into her appointment, and they met Dr. Robert K. Osborne. He was close to 45 years old, guessed Sandy. His features just beginning to soften from those of a younger man. 
He was handsome with dishwater blonde hair, neatly combed back. He had striking green eyes. His lips were full and he had just a touch of the beard growth. He was wearing a gray suit with a dark blue tie and socks to match. He welcomed them into his office and listened to them talk about their concerns. Mary was unusually quiet that day. She would brought with her a doll. And as she was sitting there, she was oh so quietly singing a childhood song to it. Bring around the roses, pocket full of posies, ashes, ashes. They all fall down. She went on over and over. The doctor had a nurse go through Mary's suitcase and remove the belt from her robe, her toothbrush, her rat tail comb, and her fingernail files. He told her parents that a weekly phone call would be best to start. He would check in with them and give them his observations, and they were to be allowed 25 minutes to speak with Mary. Sandy protested this arrangement, but Dr. Osborne said it was necessary to gain his trust, and so they left their youngest child at the hospital. One month later, Mary's parents were asked to come for a visit, and they were ecstatic. They told Father Henry, and he asked if he could see Mary and her progress as well, and they agreed. Once at the hospital, they were taken to a room. It was bare except for a desk with a few pieces of blank paper and five chairs set up in a semicircle. It was gray and with the bars on the windows, there wasn't much outside light coming in. The door opened up and in walked Dr. Osborne. He turned and said, Come with me, Mary. It's your mom and dad. They are excited to see you today, Mary. He had a kind voice, which Sandy was grateful for, and Mary slowly walked in. She was wearing her hospital gown. Her hair was combed neatly and her face freshly washed. Her eyes lit up upon seeing her parents, and they were awash with relief to see their daughter smiling. They had been told that the staff had begun to sedate her less and less to see if the medication was working, and Jim was quite sure it was as he stood to hug her tightly. She laughed and teased him, saying that he was acting as though it had been years since they last saw each other. Sandy's eyes filled with tears upon hearing her laugh, and as she hugged her mother, she asked, Can I come home soon, Mom? I believe I'm feeling so much better. She began asking about her siblings, and their activities, and then suddenly she became deadly silent and turned her head almost mechanically. It was the first she'd noticed Father O'Henry. He rose immediately and reached out his arms to embrace the child when she suddenly jumped on him like an animal. She tore and bit at his skin and clothing, and the growling started, except it was in Latin, and only the priest knew what she was saying. She spit in his face as two male attendants came in and held her back while a nurse gave her an injection. The father's face had drained of all color as Dr. Osborne asked someone to get him some water and check his wounds. Oh, my heavens, father! started Sandy as the priest put up his hand to stop her. He sat back down into the chair, shaking like a dry leaf on a cold, windy day. The doctor apologized and said that he'd been so sure she was recovering, he didn't understand what was happening. He was just mumbling on and on. Jim and Sandy were shaken to their core as they grabbed their belongings to leave. They just... They just needed to get out of this building. And as the priest and the Adams were getting into their car, the doctor ran out and asked, 
Father. What did she say, Father? Father Henry turned, and he looked at the shaken Jim and Sandy, and then back to the doctor and replied, I don't know. But, Father, began Dr. Osborne, you do speak Latin, correct? And Father O'Henry shook his head, yes, but said quietly, I don't know. I must leave now. And Jim opened the door for him. The car began to slowly roll along the gravel. When the priest asked Jim to stop, saying he needed air, Dr. Osborne was still standing outside and walked towards the priest, who handed him a piece of wrinkled paper. Then he got back into the car. As the car drove out of sight, Dr. Osborne opened the paper and scrawled as if quickly written was, she said, I am the king of darkness. I am the father of evil. I alone will destroy you and dance on your grave. Medicate her heavily. Later that year, the children's wing of the hospital burned to the ground. Mary Margaret Adams' body was never recovered. <laughs>